God created man and woman in the Garden of Eden. God never wanted a world like this. God wanted a perfect world where everything is in perfection, where there is so much of peace, there is so much of joy, and man could enjoy life to the full. But we know that in the garden, sin came after Eve and Adam. They fell to the temptation caused by the devil, and they sinned against God. And it is God's law that sin has to be punished. Sin has its consequences. When a holy God sees sin, it is the justice of God that he punishes sin. So man had to be taken away from the presence of God. Man had to be taken out of the garden where God planted man. And before doing that, God sacrificed an animal and blood was shed in the garden of Eden and God covered man's nakedness. There, God gave a promise to the woman in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. God had a plan, redemptive plan for history even before the creation of this world that God would send his son as a seed of the woman and that son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would defeat the enemy, the devil, and redeem us back from our sinful ways. So we understand from the Bible, right from Genesis all the way to Revelation, that sin is serious before God. Sin is a serious business because it has eternal consequences and sin of man calls for divine punishment, divine judgment. When you sin and when we keep on sinning, we set ourselves up for this divine punishment by God. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 18 and it's verse 20, the one who sins is the one who will die. This is the law of God. If somebody sins, they will die. And what happened in the Garden of Eden? God never created man to die. Physical death came into man also spiritual death, eternal separation from God came into the life of man because this is God's law. The one who sins is the one who will die. And the New Testament says that beautifully in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. The result of sin is death, both physical death and spiritual death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So sin is disobedience to a holy God. And what is the nature of sin? What is the characteristics of sin? Sin deceives us. Unknowing to us, sin may be very pleasurable, sin may be very pleasing to the eye, but at the end, it is a temptation of the enemy to deceive us out of the presence of God. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13, the writer of Hebrews says, none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Adam and Eve thought that this fruit looks good and it can give them knowledge and they can be like God. In fact, the devil was deceiving Adam and Eve by asking them to commit that first sin in the Garden of Eden. Sin is deceitful. Only later they realized the consequence of that sin that Satan had deceived them into committing that sin. Sin disappoints. Can you imagine the disappointment of Adam and Eve as they lay there naked in that garden away from the presence of God? How disappointing it would have been for Adam and Eve. And sin destroys. All you need to see is look around the world. Look around the destruction. Look at the pandemic. This is all a result of the first sin that man had committed in the garden of Eden. And sin finally brings death to the one who committed it. Adam and Eve committed sin and every descendant thereon will face the death, physical death and spiritual death because of the sin of the first man and woman. Ezekiel chapter 18 and this verse 4 says again that the one who sins is the one who will die. If anybody sins, this is God's law that they are destined for two deaths, physical death 
and spiritual death. Sin is eternal in its effect. Sin is not good for us to think and meditate on. And if I stop my message over here, talking about the consequences of sin in the garden and the result of sin which results in death, this message is not complete. This is not a message of hope. That's where Jesus comes into this world. There is forgiveness of sins available to us by the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that system of forgiveness through the blood has been accomplished right from the Garden of Eden. Remember the first animal that was sacrificed to cover the nakedness of man, blood was shed to cover the nakedness of man. There was a sacrifice God had to do, remission of blood to cover the nakedness of first man and first woman. And then we can find all through the Old Testament, the sacrificial system, the children of Israel taking animals and lambs and going to the temple and sacrificing these animals and lambs. The Passover in the Exodus all symbolize the remission of sin which brings them protection and forgiveness and uh, connection back with God. And that is God's law. One law is sin will result in death. But there is remission of sin available through the shedding of the blood. Come with me to Leviticus chapter 17 and it's verse 11. For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. This is the voice of God. He's telling that I have given you the life of the creature so that you will sacrifice those animals and with that blood you will make atonement for the sins. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. So man's sins had to be substituted on a lamb and the blood of the lamb made atonement, forgiveness for one's sin. Hebrews chapter 9 and his verse 22 says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. This is the law of God. That God says, if the man who sins, who will die. But the law also says that without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. And 1 John chapter 1 verse 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Finally, the Old Testament sacrifices all pointed to the coming Messiah. And in the New Testament, we understand that this Messiah became the Lamb of God. And Jesus' blood becomes an atonement for our sins. And so that we can find forgiveness and redemption and hope of eternal life uh, that we lost in the Garden of Eden. So when you come into the life of Jesus, how beautifully Jesus was birthed into this world. He was not born as a result of a man and a woman's relationship. Because if he was born in the natural way, he would inherit the sin of man right from Adam. And God promised right in the garden that the seed of the woman and Jesus was born as a seed of the woman. Mary, yet she was engaged and not living with Joseph. The Holy Spirit empowered her. She was conceived in her spirit by the Holy Spirit. And here is a virgin birth. Somebody who is in the line from Adam, coming all the way through Abraham and King David. And in that line, both Joseph and Mary comes. And here is Mary, without any connection with her husband, conceived for the first and the only supernatural miracle birth in this world. A woman giving birth to a child, a holy child, without knowing a man. And that is holy Jesus being born. A hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. And look at the life and ministry of this Lord Jesus Christ. Not like any other person. He did not commit any sin. He did his public ministry and disciples and crowds flocked after Jesus Christ. The Bible says he went about doing good, having compassion on people, healing the sick, delivering the demon possessed, rising the dead. And he just was moved with the need of human beings. When God came into this world in the form of Jesus, when he saw the suffering of man, when he saw the pain of man, he was moved. And while he was living in this world, he did 
work to redeem man to give him compassion and even raise people from the dead and that was a sign that Jesus has established the kingdom of God and these are all the fruit that we are seeing in the ministry of Jesus who went about doing good multiplying bread which only God can give and look at the claims of Jesus during his life I am greater than David I am greater than Elijah I am greater than Moses Jesus said and Jesus said that I was before Abraham was. Look at the claims of Jesus Christ. He said, I am the temple. And if you destroy this temple, I can rise the temple in three days. He made great tall claims claiming him to be God. And that was Jesus on his earthly uh, ministry. And when his time was completed, his earthly ministry was over. He was given away to be crucified. Not because of the fault of Jesus Christ. But the fullness of time came for the Lamb of God to be sacrificed between heaven and earth. The situations were arranged in such a way that Jesus would be led to Golgotha to be crucified. You know the Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples that Thursday night before he was crucified? After the Passover meal, Jesus went with his disciples to the garden called Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples are so tired that they are all asleep and Jesus is asking to watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. But they were so tired in the body. Remember, Jesus was equally tired but he was going a stone throw distance away from them and he was kneeling and praying. And his own disciple, Judas Iscariot, sold Jesus, betrayed Jesus for a couple of pieces of silver and the darkness of this night was broken by the noise of the police of the high priest and the lights of the lamb where they came and arrested Jesus at the midnight after the Passover celebration. And what transpired in the life of Jesus thereafter is hours and minutes of torrent pain and suffering like never before in his life. The whole night he was tried in the court of the high priest. They did not find any fault with him. They started mocking him. And during the trial, his own disciple, beloved disciple Peter rejected him three times. What pain, agony that would have brought into the life of Jesus. He's been tried in a human court. He gave the law. And the keepers of the law are judging Jesus right now and they could not find him guilty. Early morning, he was sent to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor in charge of that place. Pontius Pilate went through the rule books of the Roman Empire and he could not find a single mistake. A single law that Jesus had failed so that he deserves death. Forget death, any punishment, he never deserved any punishment. So Pontius Pilate, did not finding any fault with Jesus, he sent him over to Herod, the king who was in charge at the time of Jesus. So he, Jesus went now to the court of Herod. Can you imagine an arrested man, police around him, people around him, he has no freedom, he's bound, and he's going to the local king Herod, and Herod is trying Jesus, and he's taking all his rule books, and all the lawmakers are over there, and they're not able to find a fault with Jesus. And Herod, finding there is no fault with Jesus, sent him back to Pontius Pilate. Now Pontius Pilate had a problem in his hand. He is the governor. And people are rising up against Pontius Pilate. We want him crucified. But Pontius Pilate knows in his conscience that there is no mistake in this man called Jesus Christ. All his rule books are of no good to crucify or to give him any punishment. And he wanted to release Jesus Christ. And when he gave them a proposal to release Jesus, they all cried together in unison and they said, crucify him, crucify him. The people did not want Jesus. The same people, probably many people that previous Sunday, they all hailed him, Hosanna in the highest. They worshiped Jesus, but now they have come back to Jesus and they're telling, crucify him. Pontius Pilate was a very clever man. He knows that Jesus is not guilty, but there is an insurrection against Pontius Pilate. 
and he has come there for a temporary time to see the passover so that there is no insurrection against the roman empire and he had to keep that roman peace and he knows that if he does not listen to the crowd and if he does not listen to the chief priests the people may report against him to the roman empire and he may lose his position just to save his skin not finding any fault in jesus he washed his hands and handed jesus over to be crucified we heard the accounts of jesus suffering before and on the cross during his crucifixion what a painful account what happened after releasing jesus in matthew chapter 27 was 27 and 28 Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff on his right hand. They knelt in front of him and mocked him, "Hail King of Jesus." First of all, uh, the governor had uh, allowed Jesus to be scourged. This is a typical type of Roman beating. Now scourging is beating 39 lashes on somebody. You would make somebody bend down and you have a belt with a rod with nine belts coming out of that rod and the end of that rod will be thorns, fish thorns and other thorns with lead balls at different places in that belt. So when you hit once it is not the effect of one hit it is nine different leather strips with different points of thorn and lead that is getting into the skin and the flesh of a man and every hit it hits it brings out blood skin and flesh out of a person and Jesus was subjected to 39 lashes by the Roman governor can you imagine the gruesome pain Jesus went through even before he endured the cross and after all the lashes probably his hands would have been tied to a low pole and Jesus is kneeling as they are hitting him he is falling to one side and is falling to the other side the dust of that place and the mud of that place is getting mixed with his blood and water that is oozing out of his body and he was facing excruciating pain in his body and as jesus was suffering with this pain they come and put a scarlet robe over jesus christ when somebody is wounding we run for a bandage and there are wounds all over the body of jesus and for a moment jesus would have thought oh this robe is becoming like a bandage so that my wounds are covered and i can get some comfort and when jesus was thinking about it they strip that robe and oh, what an agony What a pain Jesus would have endured during that time. They spat on his face. They hit his face with their fists and they spat on him, placed a crown of thorn upon the head of Jesus Christ. He did not do any wrong. He did not deserve this treatment, but Jesus took our place on the cross and even before the cross he suffered for you and I. He suffered for the sins of mankind. They struck Jesus with their fists and they slapped Jesus. Can you imagine how insulting is a slap? And they are telling, if you are king, hail king of Jews. And they flogged Jesus and they led him to Golgotha, to a place outside the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus had to carry his own cross for some distance. Can you imagine the pain? that Jesus went through carrying his own cross people are all watching there is a huge crowd over there people have come to celebrate the passover festival as everybody is carrying the lamb to be sacrificed at 3 o'clock in the afternoon previous night they all celebrate the passover meal and the next day they carry the lamb every jewish person will carry this choice lamb 
and they're all busy selecting the lamb and as Jesus is taking the cross and going the lamb of God that will take the sins of this world people are carrying the lamb not knowing that he is the true lamb of God who is once for all taking every sin by his sacrifice and there is no need for any more sacrifice because Jesus is going to die they're all carrying the lambs and looking at Jesus and Jesus would have looked at them that they don't understand the timing they don't understand that these lambs are no more needed because I am going to die voluntarily for these people and for the people of this world and they reached Golgotha by the time Jesus reached Golgotha I'm sure that he would have been so exhausted no sleep tried emotional anguish physical anguish spiritual anguish of being separated from God and taking the sins of this world and they laid him on a cross they fastened nails on the wrists of Jesus Christ oh my God how painful that would have been and they put his feet together and they nailed him to the cross and with every beating of the nail Jesus would have cried in excruciating pain father Daddy, I can't tolerate this. It's all not recorded for us, but I'm thinking in my imagination. And they erected the cross in the midst of two thieves on the cross of Calvary. And the moment somebody is erected on the cross, your weight is on the nails now. There is no footrest. Your weight is on the foot, the nails, and your weight is on your hands. When the hands pain, he will have to elevate his legs alongside that nail that is going through his legs to somehow get relief for his hands. And when his legs are having excruciating pain and blood oozing out of his body, he will have to put his weight back on his hands. And that's how you breathe on the cross. You need to inhale, you will have to go up, put your weight on your feet. To exhale, you have to put your weight on the wrist. How many hours did Jesus lie like that on the cross? Have you thought about it? How many hours did Jesus suffer like that on the cross? The Bible account tells us that from 9 o'clock in the morning till 3 in the afternoon, Jesus was lying there, breathing up and down and putting his weight in his hands and in his leg. Six hours he lied on the cross. Not easy. To take the penalty of the sins of man, to take the death that came into man and to give us eternal life, he had to pay a very high price to redeem us. From 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, there is utter silence. People are all watching him. He is lying semi-naked on the cross and he finds the soldiers drinking wine and mocking at Jesus and taking the clothes of Jesus and Jesus' belongings and they, they tear it and cast lots. Why are they casting lots? Because they can make some quick money out of it. In olden days when somebody is on the cross and when somebody is very famous like Jesus, you get just a small commission for doing a crucifixion job and you have the regular salary. But if you have the cloth and this material, they can sell it later to make some more money. They can auction it. So they cast lots for his belongings and Jesus is lying on the cross and he's looking at those soldiers. He's looking at the high priests. They're telling if you're God, come out of that cross. You claimed yourself to be God, but you cannot help yourselves. The high priest and the chief priests are looking at him and are telling and the Roman generals are over there. And Jesus looked at these people in rebellion and he said three sentences over there between 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock in the afternoon. First he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them. He gave, he rendered forgiveness to the very persecutors of him in the cross of Calvary. There were two thieves to his right and to his left. One was mocking him and insulting Jesus. But the other was moved by this great scene. He knew that he is lying on the cross because of his own sins. But Jesus is lying on the cross for no sin of his. And he said, Lord, take me. Be with me. I want eternal life. 
And he's, Jesus turned to the thief who was seeking him and he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. He was offering eternal life. He was offering life to the one on lying on the other side of the cross even while he was dying in pain, excruciating pain. Jesus looked down and there he saw his mother Mary. Mother who carried him, gave birth to him. And it was prophesied to Mary, right? That a sword will go through your heart. And this is that moment to see her only first son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross is such a shame and such a pain for no fault of his. And she would have been sobbing. Nobody would have been able to console her. Can you imagine a mother's pain? And Jesus felt the pain of his mother. And he looked at his mother and John, his disciple, and he said, Woman, here is your son. And he looked at John and he said another statement, Behold, thy mother. Three statements from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock on the cross of Calvary. Three statements of mercy. He deserves mercy now. He needs people's sympathy now, but he is giving mercy to others. Mercy to the soldiers and the priests who are killing him. The Sanhedrin who has rejected him. And he's telling, Father, forgive them. I render the mercy. And then he's giving mercy to the thief on the cross. And he's having mercy towards his mother who is suffering the death of her own son in front of her eyes. It became 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And the Bible record says in Matthew chapter 27 verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. It is at 12 o'clock in the afternoon that the Middle Eastern sun blazes at its maximum peak. Nobody can go out and stand in a desert sun like that. It shines with its maximum capacity around 12 o'clock in the afternoon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But when the Son of Man was dying on the cross, the sun could not burn. The sun was not able to burn and it was absolute darkness in the land. Can you imagine that the other part of the world is already in darkness? Why? Because it's night in the other part of the world. And on that part of the world where Jesus was dying, the sun could not burn. Historians say that people had to light lamps in their homes and out in the streets as if it was pitch dark at 12 o'clock. That's what the historians say. People who wrote history for the Roman emperors, it is found in their history that at that time when Jesus died, the sun stopped burning. The sun could not burn anymore. And there was darkness on the face of the earth. Why this darkness? Darkness symbolizes to us about judgment of God. God was giving Jesus the punishment of sin. And for this time of darkness, God was judging Jesus for the sins of yours and sins of mine and the sins of the world at large. God was there in the darkness, judging his own son for our sin. And he could not bear that. Three hours of darkness. Jesus is suffering on that cross. Still he is not dead. And he cried out to God the Father. Because he is not finding mercy. Sin has to be punished. Somebody has to take the penalty of sin. And God the Father let his own son take that punishment. And Jesus could not tolerate it. And he said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? And he said another statement, I'm thirsty. That shows that Jesus is completely human, right? On one side, he's 100% God, but he's also showing his human characteristics on the cross. I'm thirsty. I want some water. And finally, knowing that all righteousness has been completed, Jesus said, it is finished. The penalty for sin is finished. Father has been pleased with my sacrifice. And he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he gave up his life. Jesus did not die the death of crucifixion. 
Because crucified people don't die that easily. They lie there for hours. And it is a pattern that the next day is Sabbath. Before Sabbath, all those people who are crucified had to be buried before the Sabbath. Otherwise, for three days, they'll have to lie there on the cross and they will sting. So the soldiers came to see and to fracture the knee bones. If the knee bones are fractured, they don't have the capacity to rise up and take a breath and they die of suffocation. The thieves had died. But when they came to kill Jesus by crucifixion, by cutting off or to, by fracturing his knee bones, there was no need to do that because Jesus had already died. Not a death of crucifixion, but a voluntary death. He died of a broken heart to redeem man and woman out of the sins and bring them back to God. This is how Jesus died. And when Jesus died, these are the signs that happened. What happened? There was darkness on the face of the earth. The t- down in Jerusalem, there is a temple of God built by King Solomon, rebuilt in the time of Haggai and beautified by King Herod during the time of Jesus. Even that beautification work is still going on. They are trying to beautify the temple and there was the most holy place in the temple that God enabled them to build. And in that most holy place, God resided, God's presence was over there. And that most holy place was covered by a curtain, somewhere around 70 feet high curtain. And then was the holy place where the priest would come every day and do their ministry on behalf of the people and to God inside, whose presence was there in the most holy place. Nobody could go into the most holy place because anybody who would go there, they would fall down dead. Only once a year, on the day of atonement, the high priest could enter the most holy place with fear and trembling because if he is not right before God, he will fall down dead before the great God, holy God. And when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that curtain that separated the holy place and the most holy place, the Bible says, tore into two from top to bottom. If it was down to top, it would have been manly. But this huge curtain, God tore it from top to bottom and people could see the most holy place right from the holy place and the places outside. What does that mean? When Jesus died through his death, we have direct access to the presence of God. Now you don't need a mediator. You can go directly to the presence of God through the death of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 and 20 says from the New Living Translation and so dear brothers and sisters we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This is the new life giving way that Christ has opened up for us through the sacred curtain by means of his death for us. So today you and I have direct access to the presence of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen church? Amen. So the earth responded by an earthquake. There was a great earthquake the Bible records when Jesus died. And what was that earthquake? Can you imagine in Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the law, there was an earthquake over there. When law was given, the earth shook. And when the law was completed and fulfilled on the cross of Calvary, here is a proof that the earth is shaking and the law has been completed on Jesus Christ. There was an earthquake on that Calvary mountain. The sun stopped shining and the curtain tore into top to bottom. And when they saw, there is already access to the presence of God. And that's what Jesus has done for us. We were separated from God by his death and sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. He has fulfilled every law and only through Jesus, man has entrance to the presence of God and eternal life in Jesus Christ. When the earth shook, the bodies of some saints were resurrected. What does that say? It says that there is resurrection, there is afterlife because of the death of Jesus. When Jesus died, the bodies broke out of the grave. There is afterlife 
because of the death of Jesus Christ. I want to conclude this today's message by giving you some couple of theological terms and making you understand in a very simple way. Four words to describe the work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. The work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Number one, redemption. Okay? I will explain to you in very simple ways. Redemption. What is redemption? For example, imagine I brought this iPad. I've used it for two years. All my sermon notes, my Bible studies, my contacts are all here. That means I've invested a lot of money and more than that, I've invested a lot of time putting my material over here. So it's very valuable to me. Suppose I'm going from here to my house and I lose this iPad on the road and somebody comes and takes it and I lose it. I come and see and I don't have this iPad. Then I go to the nearby shop because I need to preach on Sunday. I need something to help me to preach. I'm looking for a new iPad, but then they say, sir, if you want, I have an old iPad. And I look at it, it is my own iPad. Sir, how did you get it? Somebody came and sold it to me now. No, it's my iPad, I want it. Sorry, sir, I cannot give you because I paid money to that guy. No, he's a robber, he's a thief. It doesn't matter. The devil is a thief. Then the iPad that I already bought, now I'll have to pay another set of money to redeem that iPad back. Because I've got value inside this. I've spent time for this. I've done a lot of folders over here which are very valuable for me. I know the frame of this iPad. And that's what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. You are valuable to God. He created you. Your frame is known to you, but Satan and sin has separated us. And he paid that price to hold you because you're valuable to him. That's why God left heaven, came into this world, died for you and I. Come with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So God has redeemed us with his own blood, with his own life, brought us back. Secondly, reconciliation. What is reconciliation? People who were far off brought together for fellowship. In the garden, we had that fellowship with God. God would come in the cool of the day and fellowship with man. But sin separated that. Sin separated that fellowship with God. And Jesus dies on the cross of Calvary. And through Jesus' death and the blood, that lost fellowship is brought back. And we have reconciliation. That gulf between man and God is taken off through the blood of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 to 22. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, we were separated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in the sight of God without blemish and free from accusation. Nobody can accuse us. Why? Because God has reconciled us through Christ. My dear child of God, he has reconciled you. He has already paid for the penalty of every sin you and I can commit. And third word is justification. Justified. Given the seal of approval that this person is clean and holy because of my sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. So what happens when we believe in Jesus Christ? We are made holy holy. We have given the mark of justification. No more guilty, stamped by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is like God the Father is the judge. Jesus is our advocate. And when we go to God the Father through Jesus, Jesus accepts us and he puts the stamp of approval and says, justified. Brother Shine is justified. Brother Aaron is justified. 
living is justified you are justified the seal of sanctification approval by god the father through the blood of jesus christ and fourth it is sanctification what are the four things i told you redemption redemption is what buy back okay simple terms reconciliation to bring together okay remember this justification to give the stamp of approval of holiness through jesus christ and sanctification is to cleanse us and to make us holy okay justification is no more guilty and sanctification is uh, make us holy hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 and so christ also suffered outside the city to make his the people holy through his own blood we are sanctified by the lord jesus christ i want to conclude by reading first john chapter 1 verse 7 to 9 but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son purifies us from all sins the blood of jesus sanctifies us verse 8 if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves whom is john writing to church going first century christians and he's telling to the christians who are baptized and born again and speaking in tongues that if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us but if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness amen jesus christ died on the cross to redeem us and to sanctify us to justify us and to reconcile us back to god what is your response today what is your application for the death of jesus christ 2000 years back how do you respond the first group of people you may be sitting at city harvest and you may be watching me online but you would have never understood the blood of jesus and the death of jesus christ today he is calling you to love you to reconcile you back to god you are a sinner sorry that is the state of man everybody is a sinner and we need a savior and that savior is found in jesus christ and what do you do it's a free gift you don't have to do anything jesus took our wrath he took our penalty you just got to believe believe that jesus came for you believe that jesus died for the sins of this world believe that asking for forgiveness he can make you whole and give you eternal life why eternal life you know what happened when jesus died on the cross when jesus died on the cross there was an earthquake in israel earthquake in mount golgotha what was that earthquake when god gave the law through moses in mount sinai there was an earthquake and his some scholars say that when jesus died the earthquake symbolized that all law that was given to moses has been completed in jesus sacrifice on the cross of calvary earthquake also shows the natural signs of how earth reacted by the sun not shining and the earth shaking up when the man the son of god takes the sins of the world another thing happened the curtain of the temple in Jerusalem, the curtain that separated the holy place and the most holy place, almost 70 feet in high, was torn into two from top to bottom. What was God doing? In the Old Testament temple, in the tabernacle, God dwelt in the holy of holies. God's presence was there. And people would come around the tabernacle and the temple and worship God. And the priests would come to the holy place and do their daily duties. But nobody could go to the holy of holies because that's where God was there. God's presence was veiled for the Old Testament saints. But in the New Testament, we can get into that holy of holies because the curtain is open through the blood of Jesus Christ. Everybody has access to the throne room of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, you have access to God through Jesus Christ.